Welcome to Holy Cross Van Evaluations. Thank you for coming. We're going to have a, a relatively short video to highlight some of the things that I think you need to bear in mind when you're taking a van out for one of your trips. The first thing I want you to bear in mind is you're driving a significantly bigger, wider, heavier vehicle than the one you drive. The, the car you drive right now is about 3,000, 3,500 pounds. The vehicle that you're going to be driving, this van, is curb weight, probably about 4,000 pounds, and you're going to add on to that 12 passengers who are, this another 1,800 to 2,000 pounds. So this vehicle that you're driving will be about 6,000 pounds. And that's a significant weight difference between the one you're driving and the one you're going to drive. All right, as I said a moment ago, you're driving conditioned. You're you're conditioned to drive in a vehicle that's about 3,500 pounds. You're going to be driving what is essentially a Ford F-250. This uh, approximate drawing here is F-4250. This is the vehicle chassis that the van is put on. Now, this is aerodynamic. It's pretty well designed to carry the weight. The center of gravity in this vehicle is right about here. And the center of gravity moves as you fill up the cargo. This is fairly aerodynamic. What Ford has done is take this chassis and put a big box on it, and this is the van you're driving. Now, they could have saved a lot of money. A lot of, they, have, they save a little bit of money because they use the same chassis. This vehicle is so high that the wheelbase, width and length, make it fairly unstable, make it very top heavy. Now, the advantage is you can put 12, 14 people in here, but the disadvantage is road handling becomes a problem for you because you're expecting it to react and respond in a way that your car does. And in a moment, we'll show you a video that demonstrates how unstable a vehicle this size is with this height um, can be, even at slower speeds. You're capable of, of rolling this vehicle over at 35 miles per hour. And the video we're going to show right now will demonstrate that. You see them on neighborhood roads, on city streets, and on our nation's highways. Many organizations rely on 15 passenger vans to transport people and cargo. But these vans don't handle like a passenger car. Driving them requires certain safety precautions. Today, you'll learn why driving 15 passenger vans deserves special care and practical tips for transporting your passengers safely. The involvement of 15 passenger vans in crashes and the resulting injuries and deaths have raised many concerns about these vehicles. In 2002, in Maine, a 15-passenger van crashed and rolled over, causing the deaths of 14 passengers. 15-passenger vans usually have seating for a driver and 14 passengers. Many different groups use them, including colleges and universities, military, correctional facilities, van pools, daycare providers, airport shuttle services, churches, summer camps, school sports teams, car rental agencies, and organizations that transport migrant workers. The National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, or NHTSA, reports that in a recent 12-year period, there were over 1,570 fatal crashes involving 15 passenger vans. These accounted for over 1,100 passenger deaths. NHTSA research found that the rollover risk of 15 passenger vans dramatically increases as the number of passengers increases. In fact, 15 passenger vans with 10 or more occupants had a rollover rate in single vehicle crashes nearly three times the rate as when they were lightly loaded. The odds of this type of van rolling over when it is filled to capacity is five times the odds of rollover when the driver is the only one in the van. 
As more people fill a 15-passenger van, the center of gravity moves upward and toward the rear of the van. This makes the van more likely to roll over. It also makes the van handle differently from most cars. These factors increase the chances that a driver will lose control of the van, especially when reacting to unforeseen circumstances, like being cut off by another vehicle. NHTSA found that the rate of a rollover increased significantly at speeds over 50 miles per hour and on curved roads. Striking research also shows that safety belt use among occupants of 15-passenger vans is very low compared to other types of vehicles, increasing the odds of fatalities from a rollover. When it comes to crashes, the age of the driver was less of a factor than the amount of experience they had. A majority of highly publicized crashes involve inexperienced drivers. Many drivers tend to operate 15-passenger vans infrequently and often don't have formal training. Rollover crashes can be deadly. So it's important to know the common situations that cause the majority of 15 passenger van rollovers. The first situation is when the van runs off a road. The van could roll over when it hits a ditch or embankment, when it runs into soft soil or is tripped by running into or over a curb or similar object. The second common cause of a rollover involves the driver overcorrecting the steering when a wheel drops off the pavement or when making a panic reaction to an emergency. Referred to as oversteer, it can cause the driver to lose control and roll over or slide sideways, especially when traveling at higher speeds. When the rear of the van slides sideways or fishtails, the driver may oversteer, causing the rear of the van to slide too much in the opposite direction. Once a van fishtails beyond 15 degrees, it's almost impossible to recover. A rollover can also occur when a driver is tired, dozes off at the wheel, and loses control of the van. When the driver is traveling too fast for the road conditions, especially when the pavement is wet or icy, the van can slide sideways and off the road. When the tires hit the softer earth, the van could likely overturn. The first thing to remember when driving a 15-passenger van is that it isn't just a big car. A van handles differently, especially when fully loaded. Drivers should be trained and experienced. As a comparison, federal law requires a commercial driver's license to transport 16 or more people for commercial purposes. Before setting off, inspect the van and familiarize yourself with the locations of controls, such as headlight switches and windshield wipers. Check the position of mirrors and adjust the seat to your body. Test drive the vehicle to check the brakes and steering and make sure the vehicle is handling correctly. If you notice any problems, especially with the braking or steering, have them checked right away. Tire pressure and tread wear should be checked at least once a week. Tires that aren't properly inflated or have worn treads can cause handling problems or even a blowout. When loading the van, fill the front seats first. If possible, have passengers and cargo forward of the rear axle. If the van is loaded to capacity, remind yourself that the center of gravity has shifted and the van will handle differently than when you are driving alone or with just a few people. You should never have more than 15 people riding in the van. Avoid placing loads on the roof of the van, as this also increases the risk of a rollover. One of the most important safety tips when operating a van is to make sure every passenger is buckled up at all times. NHTSA found that 80% of passengers killed in rollover crashes involving 15-passenger vans were not wearing safety belts. Looked at another way, people who wear safety belts are 75% less likely to be killed in a rollover crash than those who don't. Therefore, it's critical to require the use of safety belts. In December 2004, NHTSA issued a new rule requiring that rear center seats in all new passenger vehicles be equipped with lap and shoulder belts as opposed to just lap belts by the year 2008. This ruling includes new 15 passenger vans. While on the road, use defensive driving techniques. Be alert and stay focused on your task. Don't use a cell phone while driving. Don't tailgate. Leave more space between you and the vehicle in front of you than you would if you were driving a car. A 15 passenger van requires much more braking distance. On the highway, be mindful of your blind spots. Allow more space and use side mirrors when changing lanes. Most rollovers happen as a result of a sudden steering maneuver while traveling at high speeds. 
Therefore, do not follow other vehicles too closely and avoid changing lanes abruptly. Drive at a safe speed for the weather and road conditions. Remember, the speed you normally drive in a car may be too fast for a 15-passenger van. In rural areas and neighborhoods, watch out for pedestrians, bicyclists, and animals that could dart into the road. Because a 15-passenger van is longer than most vehicles you drive, be careful not to cut corners too sharply. Striking a curb with the rear wheel when turning could cause a rollover. When parking, make sure the van does not stick out too far into the roadway where other vehicles could hit it. When reversing a 15-passenger van, use a spotter when possible. Back up to the left toward the driver's side of the van so you have better visibility and use your mirrors. As with any vehicle, obey all traffic laws and signs. Many rollovers in 15-passenger vans occur when the wheels of the van go off the roadway. It's extremely important to know what to do if this happens. First, don't panic. Do not brake suddenly or abruptly swing the van back onto the road. Instead, gradually slow down and steer back onto the roadway when it is safe to do so. Be especially alert when driving on rural roads. Rural roads tend to have more curves and softer shoulders than highways. Maintain a safe speed at all times. When 15 passenger vans are used for long trips, follow these additional safety guidelines. First, drive during the day when possible. Have someone stay awake in the front seat with you to help keep you alert. Take breaks often, especially if you begin to feel tired. You may be tempted to share the driving, but you should only allow people who are experienced at driving a 15-passenger van to take over. A cell phone is a good communication tool to have on long trips, but don't use it while driving. Whenever and wherever you are driving, avoid any conditions that could lead to a loss of control. Never drive after drinking or taking drugs, which includes some prescription and over-the-counter medications. Do not drive if you are tired. Get plenty of rest. Do not make sudden lane changes or abrupt steering maneuvers and maintain a safe speed. Even with the newer vehicles that have stability control systems, don't feel that they are totally safe. The systems do provide help in preventing rollovers, but they will not work in every case. If you're new to driving 15 passenger vans, find out if you can practice driving the van before you transport any passengers or cargo. This will help you get a feel for size and handling. Remember, however, that the way the van handles will change as it's loaded with more people and cargo. When driving alone or with passengers, it can't be stressed enough that everyone should wear a safety belt at all times. As the driver, require each person to put on his or her safety belt in order for the van to leave the parking lot. While driving, avoid sharp turns, abrupt lane changes or steering maneuvers, and always maintain a safe speed for the weather and road conditions. You're in the driver's seat now. Follow the safety guidelines in this program for 15 passenger vans and make every trip a safe trip. So you're, you're conditioned to driving a 3,500 pound vehicle. What you need to keep in mind constantly while you're driving this van is that it's going to take you a lot longer to stop. It's going to take a lot wider turns than you expect and that the pitch and roll of the vehicle is going to be much greater than the car you're driving. So you have to keep in mind you're driving a truck. Now one of the uh, people that I, we worked with before, she said, you know what, I'm going to put on my baseball cap and I'm going to think of myself as a truck driver. And I think that's a great idea. Whatever you need to do to, to keep yourself 
conditioned, aware that this is a big heavy vehicle. That will help. Okay? So, what do we do? I want you to remember now, there's some advantages and disadvantages of driving a vehicle this size. So the significant advantage is you have a bird's eye view of the road that you don't have in your car. You're a lot higher. So you can see farther down the road than you can in your car. That's the good news. The bad news is the distance it's going to take you to stop, the distance it takes you the width for the turns, and what happens in your blind spots are significantly greater, and you'll have to condition yourself to make allowances for those. Okay. So, all right. Now you will probably get a little handout like this to follow along with this little lecture, and it'll include external checks, preparing your trip route, getting comfortable defensive driving tips, and fundamental speed law um, requirements, and then how to react in bad weather. So we encourage you to have your little folder and hand out with you as you follow along. And, okay? So we're going to talk about external checks before you start driving. It's a good idea to walk around the van. Now, you may or may not see something like a broken light or a or a, uh, something dripping from the oil pan or something. Probably not, because these are van, new vans from Holy Cross, and they're all in good shape. <coughs> but you can't tell <coughs> what's on the roadway. Excuse me. <coughs> so walk around. Get a good look. Also, take a good lay of the land of who's beside you. If you're in a parking lot and you're kind of close to another car, you want to make allowances for that close, you don't want to pull away and make a dangerous move. The other thing you want to be aware of is if there is a little dent or some of the lights are broken or some other scratches in the van, you want to make a notation of that in your trip tech before you leave so that when you come back um, and someone notes, like, where did that scratch come from, you have it written before you get there so that you don't get held accountable for any kind of damage that's done, all that has already been done to the van. So that's a little protection on your part. Um, so an external check is a pretty good idea. Next, I want you to prepare your route and make allowances for alternative routes if you get a detour. If you're on Route 31 heading up to Townsend, and this road work going on, and they kick you off the road, and then they don't bother to tell you where the detour continues to go, as happens. You don't want to spend two hours being lost in the, in the hinterlands of New Hampshire trying to find your way back. So, and Siri all, doesn't always um, make note of that construction. So try to plan your trip out ahead of time. Now, I'm going to mention this a number of times, especially when we talk about checking your blind spots, but you want to enlist the aid of three people at a minimum when you're driving. Because you want to concentrate on the road ahead of you. So you want to have a person who's a navigator on your right-hand side, and then someone who's a spotter on your right rear and a spotter on your left rear. And they will help you when you make left turns or change lanes or move the vehicle from one portion of the road to another, you simply call out, say, am I good on my left or am I good on my right? And your spotter will help you. Because, you, as I say, you're not used to driving this 16-foot vehicle that weighs 6,000 pounds. So enlist the aid of the other passengers. Okay. So often trips are made to unfamiliar places and aids like GPS aren't enough to guide you through to your destination, so prepare yourself with an alternative route. Now I'm going to talk about in snowy weather. In snowy weather, you must remove all the ice and snow from your vehicle. Your vision, you must have a 360 degree visibility. That's the law. What you might not be used to is you're going to have a 12-foot, 14-foot roof 
that you have to clear all the snow off. You need to, the law says in Massachusetts your windshield has to be clean, your mirrors, side mirrors have to be clean, your rear window has to be clean. But in addition, you have to clear off all of the ice and snow on the roof. And if it takes somebody to get a ladder to get it off and a big broom, you, that's your job. Because if the state trooper sees you driving with the snow on the roof, he's going to pull you over. And at the very least, he's going to say, clean it off. You don't want to have to deal with any of that. Next, it says, get comfortable. Get comfortable. Before you drive, make yourself aware of all of the heater dials, the windshield wipers, the directionals where the flashes are, how to adjust the steering wheel up and down, how to adjust your seat forward and back, how high the seat will go, how to adjust your mirrors so that your blind spots are at a minimum, and uh, whatever else you need to get comfortable behind the wheel before you start. It's too late. Once you've pulled out, it's too late. So get comfortable behind the wheel in your position. But also get comfortable mentally and physically. Um, if you are like I was in college, so I'm speaking to the um, undergrads here, I had a tendency to burn the candle at both ends. And I thought nothing of getting a couple hours sleep, getting behind the wheel, and then going off on a trip. That's not a safe idea. I want you to get plenty of rest, not only for the safety of you and for the van, but for the safety of the other people in, under your care. Okay? So get plenty of rest when you're tasked with being the driver for one of these trips, because we all have that tendency. I had that tendency when I was in college to think that I was capable of anything. That's, that's not, don't do that. <laughs> OK, and if there's any um, concern about where you're going to go or what the route is, take the time to plan well in advance so that you are comfortable when you take off. And now a quick word of uh, energy drinks. Sometimes people rely heavily on an energy drink that, give, that have high concentrations of caffeine and sugar. Now they're effective in the short term and they activate your nervous system, but the effects wear off and you will experience some form of withdrawal and fatigue and drowsiness. And remember, drowsy drivers are just as dangerous as drunk drivers. And you can't know exactly when that drowsiness will kick in. And it's common for younger drivers to think that they can fight it. The dangers is still there because of the slower reaction time. So bear that in mind. Now, you know you need to be a defensive driver, of course, and that's on your mind. But your defensive driving techniques have to change in a van this size. Okay? Now, there's a, scan, there's a Smith system that's um, um, on, the line, on the web that you could probably find that identifies the ways to make a, a lane change or ways to be defensive driving. <coughs> and they are, it's called SIPTI, which means scan, identify, predict, decide, and execute. Scan the road. You're looking in your mirrors. And by the way, when I get you in the van, I'm going to show you how you use your mirrors in a new way that you don't use your mirrors in your car. Because your rear view mirror is essentially useless. So you need to rely on your side mirrors a great deal more. So there's a way to pitch them so that they're, they cover a, a larger par portion of the road in a way that you, to cover up, I mean to um, augment the fact that you don't have a um, use of the rear view mirror. 
So scan the road. So you're checking your mirrors more frequently than you would normally. Then when you identify a potential hazard, there's a guy pulling up from the side road, or the road turns, or there's a hill, or some potential hazard, you have identified it, and then you predict what's going to happen while you're in that hazardous um, environment. And once you've predicted what you're, what's going to happen, then you decide what you're going to do, decide. And finally, the most important element of, of SIPTI is to execute. And bear in mind, it's going to take you longer to execute this uh, maneuver in your van than it would take in your car. You might be able to get that around that corner at 35 miles an hour in your car. At 35 miles an hour in that van, you could slide way over to the other side of the roadway. So when you execute, bear in mind, you're in a 6,000 pound vehicle. It's going to be slower and, and uh, you have to drive it accordingly. So when you like, when you identify a possible hazard, make an assessment of what you do, then decide what you will do, finally execute in a manner that is timely. Never let yourself get boxed in in traffic. If you follow these two rules, you'll probably be safe in most instances. The first rule is good following distance. Now you might have seen or you might remember from your driver's ed, a good following distance is the three second rule, which means the car in front of you passes a stationary object and if you get to that stationary object within three seconds, you're too close. That's a good measurement for the highway, but it doesn't always work on a side road. And what I like to use, and they taught me way back when uh, I was taking driver's ed, is for every 10 miles per hour you're traveling, have one of your car lengths or one of your vehicle lengths. So at 20 miles an hour, you have two van lengths. At 30, you have three. At 40, et cetera. At 60, you have six van lengths. And that will give you the same distance in following as the three-second rule. But you can just look ahead, visualize the distance between the car in front of you, and calculate it, always maintaining a safe following distance. And I can't stress this enough. Safe following distances and proper speed will prevent most accidents. Now, what's the proper speed? Okay, we're going to talk about that a little bit later when we talk about the fundamental speed law. But if you use this measure, you won't get into um, a lot of problems you'll avoid. And that is, never travel at a speed which you can't maintain the center of your lane. If you're traveling at a speed where you turn, you find yourself turning the corners and you're swinging a little too wide, you may be going a little too fast. If you can maintain the center of your lane, you are traveling at a good speed. Good following distance and the proper speed are the two keys to avoiding a lot of dangers. And also remember that intersections are where you're going to have the most problems. You're accustomed to taking a left turn or a right turn with your vehicle in a fairly short space. You got to remember that you have to allow for that nine feet behind you. And you'll have two mirrors, you'll have a lower mirror that I want you to get used to using. To look in the lower mirror, when you make a right turn or a left turn to see that you don't drive over the curb or you don't cut too close to a car that's parked on the side of the road. You use the spotters to help you and use that mirror. And when we're, when we're in the van, I will kind of give you a little uh, tutelage on where to aim them and how to use them. But it's something you need to be um, familiar with in a way that you're not using in your car. Next, because you're seated so high in the van, you get to aim high, which is an advantage for you. Which means you don't look just at the 120 feet in front of you with the car that's in front of you. You want to look well down the road, whatever the environment is, so that you can put yourself in the proper lane 
or avoid some potential hazards that's coming up because of the longer time it's going to take you to stop and the longer time it's going to take you to get out of the lane or move. And you need to anticipate that in a time frame that is much longer than the time frame that you're used to using. So that's what we mean by aiming high. Say, especially in the city, this could be two or three blocks ahead. Now I spoke about blind spots. Always check your blind spots at every time you change your position. Now a moment ago I talked to you about the importance of checking your blind spots whenever you make a turn or change your position in the road. And I can't um, emphasize anyway too strongly the importance of checking your blind spots. And I'll give you a little for instance. We were in the car a while ago on where 190 and 290 come together in Worcester. And we were right there at the MLK exit. Okay. We were here, and we were here in this lane. And right beside us was a tractor trailer. And we were in his blind spots and out of his blind spots, back and forth. And I suggested to the student, why don't we get ahead of this tractor trailer so that we won't be in his blind spots and these lanes go away anyway. The student said that's a good idea. However, on the other side of that tractor trailer was a small pickup truck, which we couldn't see, like a Toyota Tacoma or something. And just at the moment when this student was heading over into the lane in front of the truck, that pickup truck went brrr, right to the exit. Now this student and I could have got into a dust up with this pickup truck, which would have been bad enough. But do you think this 50,000 pound tractor trailer would have had time to stop before he got here? I don't think so. So when I tell you the importance of checking your blind spots before you move the vehicle from one section of the roadway to another, I can't emphasize it any too strongly. That's the importance to have a spotter on your left, spotter on your right. Am I good to go? Yes or no? Okay. Please bear in mind, every time you change your position in the roadway, you use smog. And we'll talk about smog in a moment. And remember now, your blind spot on your left is, is less than the blind spot on your right. So try to encourage people to pass you on your left rather than passing you on your right. If you find yourself in the middle lane on the highway and everybody's going by you on both sides, it's a good idea to get over to the right lane to let everybody go by you on your left because you can see them, there's less uh, it's a smaller blind spot, and you, you want to minimize the unknown. Okay, so what does smog mean? Smog means signal, mirror, check over your shoulder, and then go when it is safe. And there are three conditions you need to meet when you pass someone. The first condition is do I need to? So you're up in Vermont, and you're behind Farmer Clem. And Farmer Clem's got a whole uh, truckload of hay, and he's going down to the pasture down there. And he's traveling 25 miles an hour on a 40 mile an hour road. Do you need to pass Farmer Clem? Yes, you do. You're not going to sit behind him for 30 miles. The second criteria you need to meet is, is it legal? Is there a solid yellow line? Is there a banner that says no passing? Is there some sort of prohibition about passing? If there are, you have to wait until it's legal to pass. So the second criteria is, is it legal? And then third criteria you need to meet when you're trying to pass someone is, do I have enough room? 
And at a minimum, on a clear, dry day in a van that you're driving, 400 feet is minimum. Can you see 400 feet past Farmer Clem? If you can, then you've got enough room. If it's wet and raining, or if it's snowy, you want to increase that distance. So the three criteria to repeat is, do I need to? Is it legal? And do I have enough room? And bear in mind, in your car, you can probably zip by Clem in a hurry. In the van, it's going to take you a lot longer and a lot wider. And you're way out into the other lane, and this oncoming traffic, it can become dangerous. So bear those in mind when you're attempting to pass. <coughs> now, we're going to talk about the communication of your vehicle to others. That is a vital tool. Like I said, when you're driving, I want you to drive with your headlights on. Your headlight won't burn out for just being on. The headlights go out because of the irregularities in the road, bumps in the road, potholes, etc. And it shakes the connector loose. That light will burn for thousands of hours if it were just in an environment. So turn your headlights on. Next, judicial use of the high beams. When you're traveling on a dark road and it's not illuminated with street lights, I want you to use your high beams to illuminate the road. And you have to remember a couple of things. First, when you approach a car from when, the, when you're approaching a car from the rear, you need to turn your high beams off 200 feet. Or when a car is oncoming traffic, you need to turn your high beams off at 500 feet. Those are the, those are the polite rules for use of high beam. Now, if somebody's coming towards you and he's got his high beams on, you can flash yours to let him know that he still has his high beams on. But if you're on a dark, dark road and it's not well illuminated, I want you to use your high beams. And the way that I suggest is, as you hold the wheel, extend your fingers on your left hand and pull the armature back towards you. That will, that will turn your high beams on. And then as soon as you see another vehicle either coming towards you or you're getting close to approaching another vehicle, you simply let it go and the high beams go off. You're probably familiar with that already, but it's a good idea, especially in the van where you are, you need all the room and all of the illumination you can get to uh, make the road clear. Okay? And the other um, aspect of the high beams that I want you to use is when you want to signal someone to go in front of you, flash your high beams, don't wave your hand. Okay? And finally, your horn. Your horn is a device that is a signal to other drivers to something you see that they perhaps don't see. It's not an extension of your personality. So if somebody's a creeping over into your lane a little and you want to give them a little heads up, doot, doot, that's what you use your horn for. In Massachusetts, unfortunately, there are a lot of drivers who only know where the horn is and the gas pedal. You'll have to accommodate for them. <laughs> okay. But your horn is a warning device to alert other drivers to dangers they may not see. You cannot speed your way to make up for lost time. It's impossible. Okay? You might make up a little bit, but you can't. You can't do it in your car, and you certainly can't do it in the van. And to demonstrate that little point, I'd like to um, bring to your attention a control study they had done somewhere in uh, the Midwest, somewhere out in Iowa or somewhere. They had a control study with two cars, car number A, car number B. And the study went over 22 miles. Okay, So think about where 22 miles is here from Holy Cross. 22 miles could go well out to Grafton, or 22 miles could go well east to, well east of uh, West Boylston. It might even get into uh, Sterling. That's a considerable distance. And this control study went through city traffic, suburban, rural, et cetera. 
all kinds of environments, and it was the same for car B. Now, car A was told to go at or above by 10 miles per hour the speed limit. Wherever you got a chance to go over the speed limit by 10 miles per hour, this car went. 10 miles per hour, that means doing 50 and a 40, or 40 and a 30. And that's, a, that's, a, that's fast, especially in those um, environments in the city. And car B was told to go at the limit, no faster. So how many minutes do you think car A finished the course over car B? Car B went to the same city, um, rural, suburban, etc. Same environment. How many minutes do you think car A finished the course over car B? And the answer is two minutes and 35 seconds. 22 miles, and he only saved two minutes. If you think you can speed your way to your destination to make up for lost time, you're mistaken. What you need to do is pick up the phone and call and say, you know what, I'm on. I'm 10 minutes late, I'm on my way, I'll be there in a short time. That's, the, that's all anybody's worried about anyway, where are you? And remember, you're in a van that travels at a speed, you accelerate and decelerate in greater distances than you do in your car, making speeding even much more dangerous. So please, bear that in mind. You cannot speed your way to make up for lost time. Um, so now we're going to talk about speeding. Now, you cannot speed your way to make up for lost time. If you can't do it. And we're going to illustrate what I mean by that. And stop. OK, that's where it, that's where it comes in. Okay. OK? So I do this whole diagram. Okay. Now, and begin. Um, many times I get a student in the car and he'll say, well, I don't know what the speed limit here is on this road. You know, I haven't seen a sign. And that might happen. You're out in the, in the wilderness there. You have the, the rule of tens to rely on to um, estimate the approximate speed of your vehicle. And the rule of tens are simple. At 10 miles per hour or 15, that's parking lots. At 20 miles per hour, you're in a school zone. At 30 miles per hour, you're in a thickly settled area. And thickly settled means the houses or buildings are closer than 200 feet together. They're not, they're closer than 200 feet. And then at 40 miles per hour, you're outside a thickly settled area on an undivided roadway. And at 50 miles per hour, you're outside a thickly settled area on a divided roadway. And we will talk about a divided or undivided roadway in a moment. Cut. OK? And begin. So whether or not you can see the speed limit sign, you have a, an approximate idea of how fast that road is safe to travel. Again, you can use your own judgment, never travel at a speed where you can't maintain the center of your lane, regardless of whatever the speed limit is. If you're finding yourself weaving a little bit too far to the right or to the left because of the, the corners and the turns of the road, you're traveling perhaps a little too fast. Okay. Now, there will be places that you will drive through where the local police will be watching to see that you maintain the proper speed limit. Now, they're there, in most cases, for your safety. If you're traveling on a 50 mile an hour road and the road takes a real sharp turn and there's chevrons that warn you and the speed limit is a warning sign drops to 30 miles per hour, Please be sensitive to those indications, because in a van this size, you'll have a hard time um, 
getting around that corner, or getting around that turn at a speed greater than what's posted. We live in New England, and the weather is a challenge. And you've learned to accommodate that challenge in the car you're driving. It's a whole new ball game in a 6,000 pound vehicle when it comes to driving in the rain, driving on black ice, or driving in the snow. First of all, when you're driving in the rain, when you hide your plane in your car, it's usually for a brief period. And it's probably not all four tires. And you slide a little, and you've hydroplaned. In the van, when you hydroplane, it's going to be at a lot longer distance, and the control will, will become critical in a way that it's never in the car. And you have to be sensitive to hydroplaning. Now, hydroplaning occurs when there's a thin layer of water on the road surface, and the tires don't have traction. And you, and you feel it in your car as a slight little skid or a slight little slip. The car can, the van will literally shift its position in the roadway from a hydroplane because of the weight. So start to watch for things that you don't necessarily feel in your car, hydroplaning. Now you'll be, you'll be driving a van that has good tires and um, that's a good protection against hydroplaning, but be aware of it, okay? The ice and freezing rain will be potentially the greatest dangers you have to face on the roadway. Now, make sure that your wipers can keep up with the rain or the freezing rain, which means you have to maintain the cab at a warm enough temperature to have the windshield warm enough so when the freezing rain hits it, it melts it quickly which means you might have to start the engine and run it a little bit ahead of time to warm the inside of the cab before you start your journey. Okay. If, you, if you take off in a freezing rain condition and the ice starts to freeze on the outside of the windshield and it doesn't clear it, you can, it's just as dangerous to get into an accident two miles away from Holy Cross as it is 200 miles. So prepare yourself and warm the vehicle up before you take off. Now, black ice in Massachusetts, in New England, is a serious road hazard. And if you've never experienced black ice in your car, good. When you experience it in the van, it'll be um, a much greater um, problem because what's going to happen is the rear end of your vehicle is going to shift and drift, as they call it. And what you have to learn is how to steer in the direction of the skid. And that's something you don't naturally feel. You want to counter steer. And when you go into a black ice skid, your first reaction is to stamp, stomp on the brakes. That's also not a good idea. So if you're traveling at a s safe speed and you're traveling at a good following distance, when you experience black ice, um, your dangers are l the, the danger of an accident is a lot less. When you experience a skid, and all skids are the same, number one, get off the gas. Number two, don't slam on the brakes. Number three, stare in the direction of the skid and number four, be prepared to counter steer after you've, after you've gained control of the vehicle. Okay. Good. And next, we're going to get into uh, what the dangers are of the snow. Now, you're going to get stuck in the snow with this van. It happens all the time. And what I want to um, emphasize here is you might be able to get out of a snowbank in your car by spinning the tires quickly and getting out. Propel yourself out. You won't be able to do that in this van. This van is way too heavy. And when you spin your tires in the snow, all that's going to happen is you're going to get deeper and deeper in the snowbank. 
what you will want to use when you're stuck in a snowbank is the weight of the vehicle and rock it back and forth and use the weight of the vehicle to get you out of the snowbank. And you don't have to do that fast. You move as far forward as you possibly can, put it in reverse, back up as far as you possibly can, put it in drive, roll forward again. And the weight of the vehicle will get you out of the, the snowbank. If after 10 minutes of trying and you can't get out of that snowbank, you're going to have to call AAA. You can't spin your way out. Okay. Number two, what I want to impress on you is <coughs> you'll probably enlist the aid of some other people in your van to help you push out. That's a good idea, but make sure you know where they are when you're going forward and going back. They're standing on a slippery surface, and if they slide and fall and you roll back, somebody could get injured. So be careful you know where they all are. All clear on my right, all clear on my left, and roll back as far as you can, put it in drive, and then try it again. Don't jam it back and forth into the gears. Don't jam it into drive and then jam it into reverse because that flywheel has little pins on the outside of the flywheel, and if you nick off a few of those pins in the flywheel, your transmission is going to start to slip, and you could do real damage. So you have to be able to clearly and easily get it into the drive and easily into reverse before you move the van back and forth. Otherwise, you could do damage to the uh, vehicle. And one last word about fog and windy conditions. Don't use your high beams in the fog. Fog is just a cloud. It's moisture in an aerosol form who's settled on the surface of the road. If you have your high beams on, it's only going to reflect and refract in the light, and you won't have visibility, which means if you don't have your high beams on, and you only have your headlights, and you only have visibility for 20, I mean for 100 or 80 or 100 feet, that means you have to drive at a speed in which you're not overdriving your headlights. Which means if you're driving at a road that's significantly slower than the posted speed limit, put on your flashers. So the guy who comes up behind you can tell why you're traveling at 35 on a 50 mile an hour road. Okay? Never overdrive your headlights, and don't use your high beams in the fog. And the other thing is, keep the windshield clean inside and out. Now, the van you're driving probably will have a nice clean windshield, but moisture on the inside and out will affect your visibility, so make it nice and clean. There are some laws in Massachusetts you may or may not be aware of. The first law is the move-over law. The move-over law says when there's construction or some official vehicle, like a police, fo police officer, a fire truck, a construction, or a DPW, or they're doing something on the right-hand side of the road, the move-over law says, move to the adjacent lane, carefully get around them. If there's no adjacent lane, very slowly get around them. That's the move-over law. If you violate that, it's a fine. But I don't want you to think of not doing that because of the fine. I want you to be aware of that because of the safety of those who are working there. They're not watching for you. It's your job to watch for them. <coughs> Next, you, um, there's a difference between no parking, no stopping, and no standing. You're going to see a, a regulatory sign somewhere that will say either no parking, no stopping, or no standing. And there's a difference, and there's a slight difference. And what I want you to remember is if it's no standing, you're allowed to pause the vehicle long enough to let a person get out. If it's no parking, you're allowed to pause the vehicle long enough to let the person, passenger get out and whatever luggage and baggage they have. You just can't park the vehicle and walk away. And no stopping means exactly that. You can't stop there. You can't pause the vehicle there. So be, be sensitive to that when you have to pull up to another university or another hospital or wherever your destination is, you might see one of those uh, regulatory signs. Okay, now when you secure the vehicle, you need to know how to turn the wheel. If you're going uphill, if you're in the city and you're going uphill and there's a curb, 
I want you to turn the wheel to the left. So if the brake fails and the gear shift fails, the car vehicle will roll and the curb will allow the vehicle to stop. If there's no curb, whether you're going uphill or downhill, you secure the vehicle by turning the wheel into the curb or towards the side of the road. Don't just leave the wheel, the, the wheel straight, it could roll. So when you secure the vehicle, make sure you know whether to turn it to the right or to the left. Okay? Intersections not controlled by signs or signals. You view them as a four-way stop. And the rules of the road for a four-way stop are the car on the right has the right of way when two cars enter the intersection at the same time. Okay? And on you, I would rather have you err on the side of caution. If you get to an intersection and you're not sure who should go first, flash your high beams to allow the other vehicle to go forward. Rules for the rotary are the car that's in the rotary has the right of way. If you're exiting the rotary at the first exit or the second exit, exit the rotary from the right-hand lane. If you're exiting the rotary from the third exit, you need to be on the inside lane to follow around. Otherwise, you'll cut somebody off. Okay? And we'll cover that when we're in the van. And finally, electronic devices. And I want to take a little moment about electronic devices. I'm addicted to this thing. When this thing rings, just like Pavlov's dog, I saliva. Okay? When it rings, when it buzzes. So I have to set my phone onto, I go into settings, and it says do not disturb while driving. So the GPS can tell when the vehicle is moving, and I don't hear any noises. Whatever you need to do to free yourself from this phone, please do, because the dangers of cell phone use, uh, distracted driving, are multiplied exponentially while you're driving a van. Please take that word of caution in the, in the sentiment that it's given. Um, these are a part of our integral part of our lives today, but you need to separate yourself from the phone when you're driving. Thank you very much for your attention, and um, I wish you the best. Good luck on your journey.